Carcassonne. What needs to be said about Carcassonne? Carcassonne won Game of the Year in the year 2000? It's been an evergreen ever since then. It's had a million expansions. Super, super popular game. Why would I cover Carcassonne as some sort of hidden, forgotten gem? I wouldn't. I'm not covering Carcassonne. I'm covering the forgotten Carcassonne, the Discovery. This was published in, I want to say, mid-2000s, around 2005. And this is one of, I think, only two Carcassonne games that were not designed by the original designer of Carcassonne, Klaus Jürgen Vreda. Uh, the other one being Carcassonne the Castle, which was designed by Reiner Knizia. This one, Carcassonne the Discovery, is by Leo Colovini. Now, from my memory, this game was actually... It, there was a bit of a hype leading up to it, to the German release, because Carcassonne was so popular, and up until then, the spin-offs had all been very successful. We have Hunters and Gatherers, we had uh, Carcassonne the Castle, we had Carcassonne the City. They were all popular in their own way. And so there's a bit of hype for every new Carcassonne release. Fun Again had some exclusive rights to it in the English language for I don't know how long, but eventually the game appeared in retailers everywhere. Um, and it was also really easy to pick up a used copy because this one, like every Carcassonne up to that point, had a little bit of hype leading up to it. This was probably the first one that disappointed a lot of people. And it's, it is different from regular Carcassonne, but it's still special and great in its own way. And this is actually my family's favorite version of Carcassonne. Why don't I show you how it plays first? Then I'll talk about why it's a board gem. To set up the game, first take the scoreboard, goes from zero to 50, and just put it to the side of the play area. Let one player be in charge of keeping score. Take all the tiles, and one of the tiles has a different back, you'll see it's kind of inverted than the other ones. So this is gonna be the starting tile, and you're gonna put that face up in the middle of the play area, and shuffle all the other tiles, and just put them around the table so there's some tiles within reach of all players. Give each player five pawns of the same color, one of which will be placed on the scoreboard to keep score, and the player's gonna keep the other four in front of them. As well, they get a player aid. The goal of the game is to get the most points at the end. Every turn, players are going to be adding, and play is clockwise, players are going to be drawing a tile, adding it to the play area, and then optionally either adding a pawn or removing a pawn. The act of removing a pawn is what scores points, and there are different ways of scoring points based on whether the pawn was placed on mountains, or the grassland, or the water. Those are the three areas that a pawn can be placed on. And each one scores points in different ways, which is outlined in the player aid. I'll explain that in a moment. And the game will continue in this fashion until all the tiles are placed. And then, then there'll be a little bit of final scoring. Any pawns that are still left on the board will be removed and scored. And the player with the most points wins. So on a player's turn, they draw a tile, put it face up, and the tile will show some combination of water, grass, or mountains, and they may occasionally show some cities here. The player will take this and they will add it to the play area in such a way that it borders at least one tile on its edge and all the edges match. So this tile could be placed like so, or like so. Or there's two mountain sides, it could be like this or this, or it could be like this or this. After the tile is placed, the player may add or remove a pawn. Adding a pawn, you add the pawn onto any of the regions on the tile you just placed. You're not allowed to place on other tiles, but the tile you just placed 
So in this case, you could place the pond in the grassy area or the water or either of these two mountains. You'll see they're actually separate. The pond doesn't score anything yet. The pond just stays there. The pond will score points when the pond is removed. And on a player's turn, after they place a tile, they can either add a new pond or remove an existing one. And when they remove an existing one, it will score points. Now, another player, now this player, for example, could do something like that, or like this even if they wanted to. And in this case, the, pawn, the, the player could add a pawn to the water or the grass, but not the mountain. And the reason is because this whole mountain area that's all connected is already kind of taken control of by, by yellow here. You can't add a pawn to a landscape and in which the, all the connected landscape already has a pawn. But, so if some player does something like this, maybe red puts it in the mountain, this is considered a separate mountain for now, and then later on over the course of the game, they may connect. This would not be connected. See, this is one mountain range, this is another mountain range. But eventually they may connect. If red is able to connect multiple pawns, because these are considered three separate mountain ranges, and later on they connect, yellow will still score points when he removes this pawn. Each pawn will score separately when the pawn is removed, and the other pawns in the area don't have any influence on that. That's a difference from regular Carcassonne. In regular Carcassonne, yellow wouldn't score anything. When you remove the pawn, that pawn will score points. And how many points it scores is outlined in this player aid, which I will walk you through. A landscape region is considered complete when it's surrounded on all sides by other landscapes. So if you were to look at, for example, this, this is a complete mountain range because it is surrounded on all sides by water or grass. There's no blank edge, open edge that it's connected to. All of these features score points in different ways. The grassland, which is on here, is in some ways the simplest. An incomplete grassland, so this would be considered incomplete because it has an open edge here, scores one point per tile that the landscape covers or extends onto. So this grassland is on two tiles, and so it will score one point per tile. In this case, this would score two points if red removes their pawn. If it looks something like this, First of all, these are considered two separate grassy areas. This is one grassy area, this is another. They're not connected. If there's a pawn in here, and then red decides to remove her pawn, like so, it's complete, and it's more than two tiles in size, so it will actually score two points per tile. Two, four, six. So incomplete scores one point per tile. Complete scores two points per tile. The exception is a tiny one. This one is only two tiles wide. So a pawn that was here and gets removed will score as if it's incomplete. It'll only score one point per tile. Let's talk about seeds. This is considered one sea area. And you can see it's surrounded on all sides by grass and mountains and there are no open edges. A pawn who's in the sea, once it's removed, will score one point per tile plus one point for every city on its shore. So this sea would score one, two, three, four, five, six. This sea would score six points if this pawn is removed. If it's only of size two, like so, or if it's incomplete, when you choose to remove a pawn, 
it won't score the number of tiles at all. It will only score for the cities. So a pawn that's here, that's removed, will only score one point for the one city that's connected to it. Finally, mountains. Mountains are an interesting thing. Let's talk about the mountains. A complete mountain range will score two points per city it can reach. The pawn can reach. And what that means is any city that's adjacent to the mountain will score two points. But you also look at all the grassy areas that are connected to the mountain. Picture the pawn walking down from the mountains into the grassy area. You'll also score for every city in grassy areas and grassland that's adjacent to that mountain range. Grass only, not water. So this city wouldn't count, but just grass. So in this case, a player who removes this pawn will right now score six points, two for each of these three cities, but not this one. Interestingly, in the case of mountains, you can actually delay removing pawns because later on, you may be able to score more points if you wait. The mountain's already complete, but if you keep playing, maybe you'll be able to add more cities. Now, if you remove this pawn, you would score 10 points, two points for each of these five cities. So the mountains are kind of unique that way. If a mountain is incomplete, when you remove the pawn, you would only score one point per city. And it's the same if the mountain is only spans two tiles. In that case, it would only score one point per city. And in this case, it would score one, two, three, four. Not this one, because this grass is not connected to this mountain. Well, that's basically it. It's a pretty simple game. Play is clockwise, and the next player will draw a tile and add it to the play area, and may add a pawn, or may optionally remove a pawn, or do neither. And then it continues until all the tiles are placed on the play area. Then that player will finish their turn, and then any pawns that are still on the board, on the play area, are removed automatically and will score points. But even if they're on completed features, they would score as if they're incomplete. So it's still worthwhile to remove pawns before you reach the end of the game if they're on completed regions, because they will actually score fewer points if you leave them till the end. That's it. You're ready to play Carcassonne the Discovery. So I'm going to mention some of the reasons I like Carcassonne the Discovery. And you decide whether they're, they fit you. Because if you're interested in Carcassonne the Discovery, it's very possible you're interested in regular Carcassonne already. And you're wondering, hey, is this a, another game that I might be interested in? And that's a really tough question to answer. In some ways, this is actually not simpler, but it's friendlier. It's friendlier than regular Carcassonne. And fans of Carcassonne might not be looking for that in a game. <laughs> they, they like Carcassonne as it is, but they want more. And Carcassonne, the discovery, doesn't really offer that. Instead, it offers a different experience. So let's talk about some of those differences. First of all, there are no roads. That's actually a selling point for my family. My wife hates Carcassonne roads. In Carcassonne, you have the cities, which are very obviously more valuable, they're worth more points. Then you have the roads, which are more plentiful, but they're worth fewer points. Well, it never bothers me. I'm getting a lot of roads, but over time, the, the luck kind of balances out and I still score points for my roads, but my wife hates getting roads. She's like, I want a city piece. Oh, another road, right? She hates that. And Carcassonne Discovery has no roads. It just has three different types of cities, if you will that all score points in different ways. The pawn use in this game is really interesting because it has two ch changes basically to regular Carcassonne. Um, and that's in, one is in terms of the placement rules and another in terms of the scoring. So in regular Carcassonne, you have something like six or seven pawns. And once you put a pawn on a feature, it stays there 
until the feature is finished and you have no option of getting it back. In the discovery, you have fewer pawns, but you do have the option of taking them back. So on your turn, you can choose to either put a pawn down or take a pawn back. One of those two, you can't do both, but you have fewer pawns. So once you have all your pawns out, then you have to make some tough decisions, right? Like maybe this thing is not yet finished, but I don't feel like that's gonna score a lot of points later. There's something else over here that could potentially score a lot more. So you know what? I'm gonna take this pawn back. You still score partial points. It's like if you have an incomplete city in Carcassonne and you just, just like, okay, I'm just gonna take that pawn back, right? In, re in regular Carcassonne can be sharky, right? P players, can you can play in such a way that the cities, you peel the tiles around where the city needs to finish and in the end there's no tile that fits in the empty space and your pawn is stuck there for the rest of the game and you know it'll only score partial points. Well, in this game, if you ever reach that point, you can just volunteer to take your pawn back and you just score the partial points then. And then you have that pawn to reuse at a later turn. So I really, I think that's, it adds an interesting uh, element, something, something to think about, that decision process of putting it down or taking it back. And when a feature completes automatically, you don't get the pawn back automatically, right? I've completed this feature but I don't have to pull that pawn yet. I can pull it later, it still score the same amount of points. I can focus on somewhere else instead, put a piece down there. Later on, I'll take this back. Just adds a little bit of an extra element, but still a very simple decision. But it also adds a little bit of interesting thing at the end, because near the end of the game, you might have pawns on completed features that you haven't pulled off yet. And every turn, you can only pull off one and score it. So by the end of the game, if you still have pawns on those, uh, on those features, even if they're complete, if you haven't pulled them off yet, you're only scoring partial points for it. So really interesting decisions, but it doesn't add a lot of rules overhead. That's what you want in a game. You want a game that offers interesting decisions in, in different and interesting ways, but not in a way, every time you add more rules, more complexity to achieve that, you're also losing something. You're gaining interesting decisions, but you're losing the approachability. You're approaching that, that ease of learning. So Carcassonne Discovery maintains that. It adds some more interesting decisions, I think, or at least they're different interesting decisions than regular Carcassonne. Um, but still, the rules are not any more complicated. In fact, there's one bit of rules, and that's in terms of the scoring, which I actually like more than regular Carcassonne. So in regular Carcassonne, right, if you have a big city and you're the only person with pawns in there, you'll score the points. Even if you had multiple pawns in there, there's, that's no advantage to you. You're still only scoring the points one time. Now, if another player is able, let's say you have one pawn in there, and another player is able to, through clever play, able to get two of their pawns um, into the um, same feature, they have more pawns than you, they are scoring the points one time, and you're scoring zero. You might have done all the work to, to uh, make that city strong, make that city valuable. And then somebody else through clever play is able to come in, and then they're getting the points and you're not. Now, I like the, the concept of clever play, and I like any game that is family friendly, but you can play Sharky if you want to, right? So in Carcassonne, you can definitely do that. Um, but it does, it can at least leave a bad taste in some people's mouth in, in terms of that. So Carcassonne Discovery does a different thing here. First of all, so again, if, you have, if you're the only person with pawns in there, you're the only one scoring points. But you are actually able to sneak some of your other guys in as well. In regular Carcassonne, if you have two or three pawns in the same feature, you're only scoring the points one time, but in this one, you're scoring points for every individual pawn. And that works also for your opponents. Let's say you're doing a lot of work building a big grassy area. You have one pawn in there. Another player through clever play is able to get two of their pawns into that same feature. In regular Carcassonne, they would score the points one time. You wouldn't score anything. In Carcassonne the Discovery, what they do doesn't directly impact the points you score. You have one pawn in there, you're scoring the points one time. But they 
will also score, and they will score, if they have two pawns in there, they'll score them twice. So they'll score twice as many points as you. But still, they're not taking anything away from you. So I actually think that's a more family-friendly way to play. And if somebody else can still do all the work and you can still muscle in, but instead of taking something away from them, you are just that, that parasite, right? You're, you're getting the, the low-hanging fruit, the, the easy points that somebody else worked so hard to get, and you're also getting them for much less work. I really like that aspect. So it adds some really interesting aspects to Carcassonne. I really enjoy playing this. So I'm a big fan of Carcassonne the Discovery, but I have to acknowledge why some people might not like it. Because Carcassonne the Discovery sits in a weird place. Being a spin-off of Carcassonne, you would say fans of Carcassonne are going to be looking at this. Maybe more so than average people. Anybody who's getting into the hobby, if they want to get a Carcassonne, of course, get the regular Carcassonne, right? That's the one that won the game of the year. That's the most famous one. People who already like Carcassonne and are interested in getting more, like more like uh, spin-offs, new versions of Carcassonne that do different things, they're almost certainly already familiar with Carcassonne. So what are they looking for? They're looking for more. Right, more interesting decisions. The you know they still want kind of the elements of Carcassonne. I would argue they would want the regular elements of Carcassonne. They still want basically Carcassonne, but maybe just a little bit more stuff. Some interesting decisions, but some different things. They don't want it to change too too much, but maybe just elevate it a bit. Maybe add more things to think about. And to those people, Carcassonne discovery might actually be a step backwards. Because in some ways, I wouldn't necessarily say it's simpler than Carcassonne, maybe a little, but it's definitely friendlier than Carcassonne. So for people who are fans of Carcassonne, they're already comfortable with it, kind of a simpler and or easier and or friendlier version of Carcassonne, that's not really going to be on their radar, right? That's not really what they're looking for. So it's hard to say who this game is for. Certainly for people who are interested in a Carcassonne game, and are uh, looking to get one, and they want kind of one with maybe family-friendly scoring or something, I would definitely direct them to this, but there just aren't that many people looking for that type of game. Carcassonne Discovery really worked for us. And I think depending on the type of game you're looking for, this could be a great fit for you. But it really depends, doesn't it? If you already like Carcassonne, you're probably good with getting expansions. Or the more recent spinoffs, you know, um, South Seas, uh, Gold Rush, the Carcassonne Around the World series. Those are some pretty solid games. And they feel like real Carcassonne with roads or road equivalents and cities or city equivalents. And the puzzly parts feel the same way as Carcassonne. So if you're a fan of Carcassonne and you want some variety, but you want it to basically be Carcassonne, look at the Around the World series. Those are really some solid Carcassonne games. I actually think Carcassonne Discovery is a solid game in its own right. It's my favorite version of Carcassonne, and it is my board gem of the week. This is my rating rebuttal. I got an iPad here, and I've loaded up on Board Game Geek all the comments from people who have rated the game 4 out of 10. I'm going to read some of them out loud and offer my hot take, offer my, uh, my thoughts on them. Uh, first of all, I haven't read these in advance. Secondly, I'm not going to attribute them. These are just, because I don't want to make it like a personal thing, you know, it's like, oh, so-and-so said this. No, I mean, you can find the info out if you really want to, but I'm just bringing them up as comments from some people who really didn't like the game. And since I quite like the game, I can offer some counterpoints. I can't decide whether or not it's better than base Carcassonne for beginners. I miss the roads, though. I think this is rated lower because I much prefer Hunters and Gatherers to this game. Yeah, that's a pretty common um, impression that I have gotten from, from other hobbyists, that Hunters and Gatherers is in some ways the best Carcassonne. I guess talking about like how it plays, I can totally understand that, but for some reason I, get, I can't get past the look of Hunters and Gatherers. I really don't like it. I couldn't even really tell you why, it just for something about it just rubs me the wrong way. But I have no problem with the look of Carcassonne the Discovery. Whether it's better than base Carcassonne for beginners, I would say it's similar. 
in terms of how hard it is to learn, but again, it's more, the scoring is more family friendly, I think. It's Carcassonne, but with really hard to remember scoring rules. I mean, the game comes with player aids, which regular Carcassonne doesn't, so that maybe says something that Carcassonne, regular Carcassonne is maybe easier to remember how to score, whereas this one needs the reminders. But once you play it a time or two, it's easy to remember. My first and last Carcassonne. Oh no! Didn't enjoy the gameplay and the artwork, which is rather important to me, for me. Looks outdated and bland. Yeah, look is a matter of personal opinion. It's a very kind of pastel colored, like it's a light green, it's a light blue, it's a light gray. I don't mind the look of it at all. And the way it all comes together to form kind of a landmass, I think is, uh, it looks all right. Rating after one play. Gameplay is too similar to regular Carcassonne, but worse in my opinion. Production is kind of bland and washed out. Ultimately, no reason to play this instead of regular Carcassonne or any of the newer and flashier versions. That's not unfair. Um, obviously, you're going to have to look at the game yourself and decide whether the look is important to you. The game plays a little differently. I would agree that regular Carcassonne, especially the new version of Carcassonne, is a little uh, flashier. than, uh, And of course, you have the Carcassonne Around the World series, which look great in their own way. And by comparison, this one might look a little outdated. It is from 15 years ago. So I don't think this looks any worse than, <clears throat> than old school Carcassonne, just my opinion. Played one time with two players. Yes, this is by far the most original Carcassonne. The scoring is different enough that old ways of thinking about tactics don't really work. That's the good news. Yep, so far I'm on board. The bad news, it's still just another Carcassonne. And if you already have one or more Carcassones, you don't need this. But if you don't have Carcassonne, I will say that this, while being the simplest, might also be the best standalone Carcassonne out there. Maybe, yeah. I, I think this person is not too far away from my, uh, my line of thinking. Um, I think this is a really solid standalone game. Of course, you're not going to be able to have expansions for it, so if you're into expansions, that's one thing. But yeah, I did mention that point. If you already have regular Carcassonne, you're looking for something more, I'm not sure this is going to be it for you. It's actually a really neat replacement for regular Carcassonne, but if you already play Carcassonne and you like it, maybe you're looking for something else. So if you are not into buying expansions and just want the base game, this is a very good one. Tension is high. That's more good news. More bad news, it's also the simplest and most vanilla of the Carcassones. Of course, if you know anything about Leo Colovini, you'd expect that. Yes, uh, exactly. Um, Leo Colovini's designs are streamlined and polished, so there's not even a single rough edge around it, and that's not for everybody. Um, sometimes a rough edge can make a game more fun, like in Carcassonne, the fact that the cities are worth more than the roads, then people want the cities and they don't like getting roads sometimes. Um, but there's enough tiles in the game that the luck balances out, but still that imbalance of getting cities versus roads can make for a fun experience. And again, Carcassonne the Discovery is not going to have those sorts of highs and lows. It's a Leo Colovini game. But it's also the most tense Carcassonne. And if you know Mr. Colovini, you also knew that. Rated a 7 if you already own a Carc, 8 if you don't. I'll give it an 8 while pretending no other Carcs exist. Okay, but then he updated his, or he or she updated his, their comment. Hasn't aged well for me, especially as I'm enjoying base plus traitors and builders the most. Okay, fair enough. Um, Carcassonne has expansions, and perhaps with the addition of expansions can make a regular Carcassonne and elevate it a bit higher than this one would. My least favorite of the Carcassonne variants and expansions I've tried. I like the original and Hunters and Gatherers about equally. Also, my least favorite Leo Colabini design. Favorite is Carolus Magnus. Check out my video for Carolus Magnus. My primary complaint in this game is that interaction is even more indirect than regular Carcassonne. True. Uh, that, that's what, what I was referring to when I was referring to more family-friendly scoring. One person said not nearly as good as Vanilla Carc. The main problem with this game is that the original Carcassonne is better would rather play regular Carcassonne and would always pick that over this. That's actually three different people all basically saying the same thing. Um, just 
this came after Carcassonne and Carcassonne is better, so why would you play this? It's different, and I like the differences, but if you already have Carcassonne and you're very happy with Carcassonne, consider getting expansions or some of the newer spin-offs, which are much closer to the uh, Carcassonne formula. I read that some people think of it as Carc for beginners, which I don't really get. It's different, but not really simpler. Some interesting twists on the Carcassonne model, but is it worth getting? I don't know. Yeah, that, that's fair as well. Some people call it Carc for beginners, and I don't know why either. It's not really simpler than regular Carcassonne. Regular Carcassonne, base Carcassonne is plenty simple as it is. This one's just different. It's different and also still simple. I think the reason people think it's simpler is again because the scoring is friendlier, so it feels more like a family game. Carcassonne's already a family game, but it can be played in a really sharky way, and Carcassonne Discovery can't. It's family friendly through and through. So I think that's why some people, you know, usually games that are f more friendly for families in a family setting are also simpler because, you know, kids can play. So. I think that's where some of the confusion comes. It's not really simpler than regular Carcassonne, but I think it's a better one to play with a mix of kids and adults. Arguably the weakest link the car in the Carcassonne stable. Couldn't quite put my finger on it as the rule for scoring only when removing the meeple is quite good. Then realized it's the tiles. Endless tiles of sea and mountains with only the odd port to break the monotony. It's really dull. Half the fun of Carcassonne is seeing the buildup of castles and monasteries not an endless plateau of mountains and a sea of green. That is a matter of personal opinion. This one, I feel, has more variety. It has fields of green, it has mountain ranges, it has water, a lakes, and Carcassonne is a sea of green with just some weird, oddly shaped cities and some roads connecting them. So that's all, that's all personal opinion. I think this one looks better than regular Carcassonne, my opinion. Interesting ideas, but the game lacks the cutthroatiness of original Carcassonne to make it interesting. The map also looks nowhere near as pretty as some of the other versions. All in all, a bland feeling permeates this game. I wonder if the choice of having pastel colors for the grass and the water and the mountains was maybe a poor choice. Maybe if it was more visually distinctive. Um, I have no problem with it, but Again, have a look. Judge for yourself whether you think the look is all right or not. I played this for the third time a couple of nights ago. I was teaching two people new to the whole Carcassonne play mechanic. They were totally confused by the scoring and kept asking me how to score things. I myself had to keep looking at my score sheet before deciding on a move to make sure I knew how it was going to work out. Because of this, I found it very complicated, as I did the first time I played. I would take regular Carcassonne with a ton of expansions first. That's something that more than one person has mentioned. They find the scoring in Carcassonne the Discovery to be confusing. I guess that's they, the publisher, Hans and Gluck, I suppose they noticed that as well, which is why they included player aids. Um, I find once you learn it, it's really simple. I don't know why a number of people are saying that they find the scoring complicated. I mean, it's different from regular Carcassonne. Maybe if they're used to regular Carcassonne, uh, they would be confused that this is different, but this last user was saying they were te he was teaching new, this player was teaching two people new to the whole Carcassonne thing, and they were confused by the scoring. I'd wonder if those people new to Carcassonne would also be confused with regular Carcassonne. Certainly, if you threw in expansions like this player would want to do. I think if you don't want to be tempted by expansions, and you want a good, solid, standalone game that's fun in a family-friendly way, I think Carcassonne Discovery is really solid. And if I had to choose between base Carcassonne and Carcassonne Discovery to keep in my collection, I'd actually keep this one. But keep in mind, I am definitely in the minority. A lot of people like the base game and the base game won game of the year. And so this game's coming out, people are obviously going to compare it to the base game. And if they already like the base game, are they going to like the changes in this one? Certainly the publisher and designer, I'm sure, hoped that uh, the differences would be interesting to people. Um, if you look at a lot of the spinoffs, including the castle, including the city, where they change the game actually quite dramatically, they probably don't want, they probably figured people just don't want regular Carcassonne. If they did, they just play Carcassonne. They want Carcassonne, but something different. 
And so they do something really different with it, right? And Carcassonne Discovery is a really different Carcassonne-like experience. It doesn't even feel like Carcassonne. If I were, I mean, obviously it has tile laying and has pawns you're scoring points for. But to me, it's Carcassonne Discovery and Carcassonne the Castle are like if you gave a vague description of Carcassonne to Leo Coldovini or to Reiner Knizia and said, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this is generally how Carcassonne works. Now you recreate it. They come up with different things, right? Depending on how detailed the explanation is, they would go in different directions. And so Leo Colovini went in this direction, and I think it's an interesting direction. This is an underappreciated game. And it's always going to be, because it's always going to be in the shadow of regular Carcassonne. Since then, uh, they've, uh, the publisher, Hans and Gluck, has played it much safer with the uh, spin-off games. And the new series around the world basically just feels like regular Carcassonne, but the changes are much smaller. And this one revamps the game. And because it revamps it in a more family-friendly setting, I think people also get confused into thinking it's like Carcassonne Jr. <laughs> and it's not that. It's not that at all. It's just a different Carcassonne. It's a different experience. And it's one that I happen to appreciate quite a bit. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Carcassonne the Discovery don't stop being good necessarily just because new games come out. Take care.